again after party tonight, 23 o'clock. Uh, I'm really uh, delighted to announce the next speaker, Toro Kohler from Opecto and a comrade cooperative. He's one of the, in my opinion, greatest uh, visionaries in the Bulgarian blockchain space, so be sure that you're not going to miss that today's speech. We need to be one slide back. Is there one slide back? No, oh, where's my other slide? Guys? Oh, okay, cool. Okay, so uh, it will be a bit of cliche, but uh, I would like to start uh, with a joke. And uh, yeah, what's the, the, the common thing uh, between bosses and seagulls? Boat, camp, squawk, mess up everything and fly away. And uh, I'm talking with a lot of people and uh, both uh, people that are employees and people that are employers. And all of them seem to be kind of frustrated of what, what's, their role, what, what, what's happening basically in their company. Uh, employees say bosses are stupid, bosses say uh, employees are incompetent, and the ones that are competent are very hard to find. And if you find them, it's usually they, they come for the money and not for your purpose and for, for, uh, for, for your fight. They just come uh, for, for the good money, the, the, the competent ones. Mm -hmm. And um, that, that creates uh, a lot of uh, frustration and tension. Basically, no one is, is, uh, is feeling comfortable in this situation. And uh, if we want to see why, why this happened, we need to see what, the, what are the fundamental reasons. Because it's not about one company. It's about any vertical, any kind of size company, any type of company. Everywhere we see the same disengagement of the employees to their uh, company's purpose. And uh, to understand that fundamental reason, probably we need to understand what's the structure, the structure of our economy. And capitalism is a great thing, a great system. Basically, it's the thing that uh, made our civilization to that point. Uh, it's the, the most effective um, economic system that we have ever discovered as humanity. But the problem with the capitalism is that it has one uh, side effect, uh, one, one small thing, that it basically concentrates ownership. The ownership is basically taken from, uh, from most people and is concentrated in the few. And the problem is that, the problem with that is that ownership actually equals responsibility. So what happens is that most people, most humans, are not humans, not treated as humans by the system, but they are treated as human resources. Just resources that are needed for the business to do whatever the business needs to do for its owners. And the thing is that there might be a cheaper resource on the horizon, a resource that emerges now. It's called automation. And it's not about just our mechanical work, but basically about everything that boils down to following certain procedures and have some narrow field in which you specialize. Every time you do that, if that's your job, then it's gonna be automated. Because very soon, very soon, literally our phones will be literally more smarter than us. And by very soon, I mean <laughs> somewhere between 2023 and 45. And actually, when Adam Smith defines capitalism, he was talking about the, the free market, the pri uh, private uh, property. These are all great things. And he also talked about uh, paid labor. And his argument was that the paid labor is simply cheaper than the slave labor. Because slaves, they, uh, they're, uh, they're slaves. They, they don't have free will. They, um, they are made to work. And by that they are made to work, they don't have an incentive to become better. They don't have an incentive to, to be innovative, to be more effective. They just work because they have to work. And the thing is that now we, we probably have a better, uh, a better option than we humans being a resources. There, there is probably now a, a, cheaper, uh, a cheaper labor, a machine labor. So if there is a machine labor, then we humans 
can stop playing resources. We can start playing actual humans. We can probably become really free. And yeah, if, if the last time we become free than before, we, we become also more efficient, probably we will also become more efficient if we, we become even more free. So we will all need to answer that question. What will do if we don't have to do anything? And that's a very important question because that boils down to our human nature, what we as humans want to achieve. Because machines, they are good in solving problems. You give the problem to the machine and it solves it. You have a work to do and the machine does the work. It's a resource. But we humans, we want. We have this ability to have aspirations, to have dreams, to, to want something. And the question is what we want. And I doubt the answer is we want to be resources. So if, if we need to answer the question what we want, probably it's something good. Probably we want to clean up the planet. Probably we want to go to Mars. Probably we want to become better humans. But yeah, it's about what we want. And the thing is that if we don't work for each other as resources, then we can still work with each other as, as partners, as peers. Someone can come and give capital. Someone will come and give the idea, the knowledge. Someone will come and give some, uh, let's say, support. But does we need someone to actually own the thing? Or the thing can be self-owned? The problem with that is that currently our only way to manage each other in a group is by having a, a chief one. Someone who decides and everyone else follows. But that's actually a very ancient problem. And in mathematics, it's known as the problem of the Byzantine generals. The thing is that we humans, we want stuff. But we also need to survive. We are survivors. And sometimes, because we need to survive, we break great things that we have built in our civilizations, things like moral and sometimes things like law. We, we break it just because we need to survive. So the problem with the Byzantine generals is that these Byzantine generals have occupied the city and they need to decide whether to attack the city. But uh, they also rebel uh, between each other. So if, uh, if uh, like one general can say, okay, let's attack, so everyone else goes to attack the city and then he attacks uh, the other generals from behind. So the, the generals have an incentive to lie their peers. So the, the question is how we can build a system, uh, like formally defined, how we can build a system uh, of agents that pass messages between each other. And by uh, passing these messages, they need to have a coordinated action without none of these agents to be a uh, chief one. So how we do that? And that problem remained unsolved for a very, very, very long time. The first practical solution of this problem came 1999. Uh, yeah. And uh, the thing is that the, the, major, the major breakthrough actually happened in 2008. 2008, uh, nine years after the first practical uh, solution, this thing appeared in a cryptographic mail list. It's uh, an autonomous message from a guy called, or a group called Satoshi Nakamoto, and they basically propose a practical solution to the Byzantine fault tolerance problem but also they propose an economic model that will uh, keep the, the peers of the network, uh, the, the, net, the peers will keep the network running longer than just a scientific experiment. Basically, Satoshi suggested an economic model how a Byzantine fault tolerant network can keep going forever. And the interesting thing is that this happened actually just month and a half, month and a half after the, after the big crash 2008 when the whole world economy crashed because of its centralization and because of its passing responsibility upwards. But what's, bit, uh, what's blockchain? Because Bitcoin, the distinct Bitcoin is actually a blockchain and what's blockchain? And blockchain is nothing than a ledger. A ledger, uh, an, a, an notepad where we write transactions. And each page of this magical ledger is it's a block, and we um, 
the, the participants, they write these uh, transactions in blocks, they spread them between each other, they have Byzantine fault tolerance consensus algorithm to decide what's actually written, uh, and they agree on the common rules about how we write these pages. And if someone disagrees with this network, he gets kicked out of the network. And if we take this idea further, what Ethereum does is it says, okay, so we may put a bit more complicated rules here. So it's not just you can spend only the money that you have and you can spend money only once, uh, the same money only once, but we can actually define more complex rules more complex rules about how we write things in our ledger. And if we take this idea a bit further, we can create something that's autonomous wallet. So it's a magic wallet. You put money in this wallet, and you know that this money can go out only by the rules of the contract. There is no other way. If this smart wallet lo lo locks itself, then you cannot get this money out. And it actually happened several times. I think the last one was the parity hack with uh, 300 million locks in such an autonomous wallet. But if we take, so it's a reality, but, but if we take this one step further again, we can create an autonomous reward system. So it's something like, it, it's a game. Let's say it's a Catan or chess, it's a game. And in this game, we have participants. These participants, they have roles, they have incentives, they can have some system to reward each other, they can have some system to, of uh, making decisions together, and uh, it doesn't need to be voted. We can actually invent a, a token economy, a token economy that, as a result, uh, uh, ends, it ends with decisions. And this system doesn't need to be owned by anyone. This system can just exist on the blockchain and can be, can be self-owned, uh, <laughs> autonomously owned. But if the system is autonomously owned and not owned by anyone, that's equal to be cooperatively owned or owned by everyone. So cooperatives are an interesting thing. Cooperatives exist, they ever existed. They are not a small thing actually in Europe. 70% of the population participates in some kind of cooperation, cooperative. Uh, they make one trillion uh, euro uh, turnover per year in Europe. And the, the cooperatives are interesting because uh, they, they're, they're flat structure, they're member owned, every member is an owner, and uh, they, they choose a board, but the board is chosen. The board is not chosen by the, by the few shareholders, but the board is chosen by all the members. And every employee can become a member, they're, they're open to, to join. And the, the cooperative exists, but they, they are not the most profitable thing, aren't they? The companies are still better than the cooperatives. And the problem is that, sorry, and the problem is that in the cooperatives we need to answer one question, how we spread the income. So we'll make some money, and basically how we spread this money if everyone is equal and everyone is the owner. But the thing is that everyone is, everyone has one vote, but not everyone is equal. And we can introduce a way, a system, how we distribute profits. And I'll suggest you now one system. We call this thing high risk automated debt. And what's the idea of high risk automated debt? Basically, you have this group of people, they want to build something, and to do that, they do work. They reward each other with debt tokens. The debt token is something that each uh, one debt token is gonna be bought back for one euro, exactly one euro. But it's gonna be bought back when the income starts flowing in. So when the income starts flowing in, we buy back our debt tokens and we reward our people with real money. For each token, we give one euro. So you don't know when exactly you're gonna get your money, but you know exactly how much money you're gonna get. And uh, we can give these tokens to, to peers, like peers can uh, peer reward each other, they can uh, peer reward bounties, uh, crowdfund bounties, and then whoever takes the bounty takes the reward. Uh, we can also raise money from investors this way. We can go to investors and say, okay, give me a loan, and I'm gonna return you this loan 10x or 8x. And uh, yeah, I'll just give you 10x the tokens and you know that you'll get 10x the money, but you just don't know when. Which is a good deal and still a loan, it's a legal loan. And that's one system that can solve this problem, can basically make a group of people work together, get three words, and none of these people actually own the system. 
And the thing is that we actually created this. Last year, December 2017, we've established the Comrade Cooperative. And Comrade Cooperative is now, let's say, nine years, nine months old because we actually started from January. And uh, it's now 43 members. 21 of these members are active contributors daily. And we currently raise 320k euro funding. We are also working on two cutting edge projects that I'm just gonna present. And uh, the thing here is that, do you know startup, privately owned startup in Bulgaria that has done this? Because I haven't. And I, I think that's a proof that a cooperative can be actually more efficient than a startup. But what we do in this cooperative? The first thing we do, we have two pillar projects, and the first one is called Autonomy. Autonomy is basically our, our cooperative model, our way of structuring our work. And it's basically, it's a system for managing high-risk automated debt, for issuing and liquidating high-risk automated debt. And it's, it's, uh, it's an automated thing, and you can, um, you can apply this system in a cooperative. If you apply the system in a cooperative, that's the actual governance model of the cooperative, and it's a completely autonomous organization member member zone. But the interesting fact is that you can actually get autonomy and apply it in any company. Any company can get autonomy system and apply it as a bonus uh, as a bonus system for its employees, so it can engage its employees. And what's autonomy? Basically, autonomy is a, a template and set of uh, management consoles and uh, smart contracts. So basically we give you legal contracts, we give you smart contracts, and we give you web UI, so you can run autonomy model as a bonus system in any company. And that's something we work heavily. You can, of course, uh, for everything I've said, you can check our GitHub, uh, everything is open source. Uh, but uh, this thing is almost ready. Uh, we, we just also uh, got the funding from Aragon, the biggest uh, uh, DAO project till now. And uh, we are, we are going to be releasing something uh, early next spring, uh, early in the spring next year. So yeah, uh, that that's autonomy. But we also want to get one step further, and don't just create a autonomous, uh, an autonomous company, autonomous organization, but we want also to create an autonomous product. And uh, I was really fascinated by the Terminator Terminator movies. <laughs> by the idea of Skynet. Because Skynet is a machine without a switch off button. There is no button that you can press and switch off this machine. And that's, that's a fascinating idea, but it was uh, just a science fiction till recently. But now with blockchain, with Byzantine fault tolerant network, and the advancements in AI, we can actually create such machine. And we are actually creating this machine, and we call it Skynet. And what's Signet? Signet is a blockchain that utilizes useful proof of work to train AI agents. So basically it uses the mining power that's currently going to just crunch hashes to actually train AI. And it also uses a new advancements in the machine learning called AutoML, Meta Heuristics. That's basically an AI that's doing AI. So it's an AI algorithm that's trained just to make better AI algorithms. And last year, Google, with two papers, actually proved that such approach, given enough computing power and enough data, can produce better AI than any human expert till, till the publication of these papers. And yeah, so, so we have the useful proof of work, we have the, the self-improving agents, and it's also a utility token circular economy. And utility token circular economy, um, uh, which actually incentivizes participants to provide data and to provide computing power for this enormous self-improving AI. And that's also something we, we work on, something that's uh, gonna be ready soon. We already have prototypes, you can check in our GitHub repo. And now we are working to put everything together and basically launch the network. So this is our second uh, pillar project. And this is us. This is our uh, part of our team. Uh, this is our website. If, if you are interested in every, the, the things that I said, you can check our website. Uh, there you can also join in our Discord channel. As a cooperative, we are 
completely transparent. Like you can see our daily work in the cooperative through our Discord channel uh, and get to know us. And we are decentralized autonomous organization. Decentralized autonomous organizations are not some abstraction, some dream, something good that will happen probably in 50 years. Decentralized autonomous organizations are something that happens here and now. And we are proving it. Thank you. Guys, do you have questions? Uh, personally, I hear a lot. Somebody from the room, do you have questions? It was okay. Uh, maybe I can ask one or okay. Okay, uh, one question. Uh, you say uh, autonomy is about decentralizing the institution as a, as a the company institution, right? Mm -hmm. So who takes the decision of where the money goes? How do you make that decision? Um, okay, so uh, you, you can have a completely decentralized organization, which is a cooperative. In the case of cooperative, our group takes the decision. So it's the same question as asking who ensures that uh, blockchain stays secure. Everyone ensures that the blockchain stays secure. It doesn't need to be one person. Uh, we, as, as a system, we take decisions. And uh, yeah, I can go with the token dynamic, but uh, it's a bit complicated. But let's say the easiest way to do that is uh, um, delegated proof of stake. This delegated proof of stake voting. Anyone else? More questions? Uh, maybe I can ask one. Okay. <laughs> Uh, like like you mentioned, the movie, uh, the outcome was not so good. So, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, what are, uh, let's say, um, stopping mechanisms or like uh, triggers that are going to unlock, uh, and, uh, let's say, they open the Pandora box, but you will not be able to close it? Do you have that kind of mechanisms? Okay. Uh, so what, what happened in the movie is that the, the, the guys uh, gave this autonomous machine guns, uh, which was probably not a good idea. Uh, what our machine is, that is doing is, is making predictions. So our AI has a very practical reason, very practical purpose. It makes predictions for now. And what predictions it makes? Currently, it makes predictions for trading crypto assets. Basically, it gets better and better in predicting the price of, let's say, Bitcoin, Ethereum, and stuff. And uh, our target market are currently hedge funds. Hedge funds that need these alphas, these primary signals, so they can construct their portfolios. And we, we target this market uh, of, of hedge funds. So, so right now, it's nothing about giving guns to sign it. And uh, so, so that's one thing. And the other thing is that um, the, the, the idea is that the same as blockchain, no one actually controls the thing. But in a sense, we all control it. So if all the participants in sign it decide that they want to sell this drug, probably they will do it. But that's unlikely, because probably they will have this enormous power and channel it somewhere, it's, it's, it's usable, but it, it will be a collective decision. No single malicious party can make this decision. Everyone needs to be malicious against themselves to, uh, to, to self-destruct. But yeah, it's uh, probably something we'll need to see. And the thing is that you cannot put censorship on technology. You cannot say, we are not going to do that. We are not going to open this Pandora box. Because when it's possible, someone will do it. Someone will do it anyway. And let's do it early, and let's do it with the intention to be cooperatively governed rather than some corporation launches it and then it's uh, actually owned by one big company that's trying to build it. And a lot of big companies are trying to build su such things. These auto MLs, uh, meta heuristics, uh, Google launched one uh, last year. This year, two new appeared, Auto Keras and uh, Transmogrit AI. Transmogrit is from Salesforce and they were actually working for it, uh, on it for several years. They're now releasing. But probably till the end of the year, we'll see several other auto ML uh, mechanisms uh, emerging. So yeah, it's a very, very new field and we don't know what's happening. Uh, thank you very much for answer. Uh, yeah, our question, oh, that's for waking up. <laughs> Hi, I'm just curious to know if you have thought about strategy in case of inability to reach consensus in the cooperation, like 50-50 percent. Yeah, uh, this is, uh, part of the Byzantine fault tolerance uh, uh, solution, and uh, the idea is that uh, sometimes you are not reaching a uh, sometimes you are not reaching a consensus, and sometimes you have groups that divide. So these guys think this thing, these guys think the other thing, but uh, 
But the thing is that we, we expect that. We, we don't try to prevent it, we expect it. So when a group disagrees, it just forks and it creates another organization that uh, kept its own life. Uh, you mentioned about predictions. How sure you for the predictions are correct? What was the chance to be the wrong prediction for the... Ah, it's, it's data science. Like you have a test set, validation set, you know what's your prediction error on data that the algorithm never saw. Uh, so yeah, uh, currently uh, the, 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 so the self-improving part, we are using auto keras and transfer grids inside the system. So the, the, the meta heuristics themselves, so the AI that creates AI, we have our own version, uh, but actually uh, we the, the, the ones that are open source now are better. And uh, the accuracy that we achieve, let's say for predicting Ethereum price, we have 78% sign accuracy of whether it goes up and down. And the idea is, uh, and um, yeah, the, the, the baseline is 70% because 70% of the times the price goes up. And we are 78% accuracy, which means that we are 8% better than a trivial algorithm. That always says that it's going to be up. So we are, let's say, 11%, uh, yeah, 11% alpha. We can, we can. I think that that's everything. I'm sure that Toro is going to be around, so we can meet here again. Um, I think that uh, that was everything. Thank you very okay, much, Toro. Thank you.